Welcome to you here in the hall and to those of you who are watching this virtually. Tonight I'm giving a presentation on the Alexander Technique and I want to tell you why many musicians find learning the Alexander Technique so valuable how you may begin to apply many of these principles right now, the history of the technique, the ideas that are involved in this technique, what Alexander lessons are like, and most importantly, what all, what all of you do right now, even without an Alexander teacher. All of us are involved in many hours of Zoom classes, lectures, and using your body well during this challenging time is very important. I am not a trained Alexander teacher, but I have had many years of lessons and have used the technique in my own playing and teaching. The technique is helpful in many aspects of your life, be it learning a new piece of music, taking a lesson, performing in a concert, or carrying your heavy backpack across campus to name just a few things. After my class, if you'd like to ask a question, go ahead. Know that um, anyone who'd like to get uh, a reference guide from me that will have videos and reference books, just email me, my e Tufts email address, nina.barlow at tufts.edu, and I will be happy to send you uh, this reference guide, just put in the subject line, Alexander Technique. <clears throat> we are very fortunate at Tufts to have the Alexander Archives, and if it, you get interested in this topic, you can make an appointment through uh, Tisch to go and see the archives. So let me begin by talking to you about who F.M. Alexander was. He was born in 1869 and died in 1955 at the age of 86. He was born in Australia on the isolated island of Tans Tasmania, south of the mainland. <clears throat> Growing up there made him very observant, self-reliant, disciplined, he was very interested in Shakespeare as he grew up and the art of reciting, which was very popular at this time. He became an actor who recited the great Shakespearean speeches. At this time, there was no amplification, so clearly projecting one's voice was absolutely critical. Alexander began to have trouble with his throat which affected his voice, and at times, he lost his voice completely. After consultation with many medical doctors, he was told to rest his voice between performances, which he did. He did rest his voice, but at the end of his next recital, he could sparely speak. He kept resting and performing, but this did not solve his problems. He asked his doctor, might it be something that he was doing and using his voice that was causing the problem? And the doctor agreed, but offered no guidance. Alexander decided that he must find out for himself. Alexander decided to use a standing mirror to give feedback and to help him see what he was doing while he was speaking a Shakespearean text. So you can see here that this man is standing in front of a mirror with a text, observing what he's doing. Alexander found that he was continually pulling his head backward when he began to speak, but had not noticed that this had, was a habitual habit. Upon further observation, he discovered he was lifting his chest, arching his spine, narrowing his lower back, stiffening his legs, and pushing his toes into the floor, as well as retracting his head, which was the final factor in reducing the efficiency of his voice. So if you look over here, you can see this actor who is mimicking all of these really inappropriate behavioral 
motions. All this felt very natural to Alexander. And when you have a habitual pattern of behavior that you've been doing for a long time, I say to my students, if I say to them, can you straighten up? And I have them straighten up. And they say, how does it feel? And they say, terrible. Because that is what they are used to doing. The mirror revealed things he had never noticed before. And he realized that he could not trust his feelings, pulling his head back, lifting his chest, arching his spine, narrowing his lower back, stiffening his legs, and pushing his toes into the floor, as well as retracting his head, was clearly a continuous habit and that interfered with his speech, even though this did not feel inappropriate to him. He noticed that the majority of the weight of the skull is in the front of the spine, and the head is naturally inclined to nod effortlessly forward. This allows the neck and spine to lengthen. So if you look at the skull there, an adult skull weighs about 10 to 11 pounds, which is very heavy. And so if it's on the spine and it, it just naturally wants to be a little bit forward, and then you're able to lengthen the spine. He noticed that the head is pulled down and back. The spine cannot achieve its length. So if you're this way, you, you now are shortening the spine. When the head is balanced, the neck and spine can lengthen. Alexander continued to observe his own use. He noticed if his head was balanced on his body, <clears throat> and breathing became effortless. Oh, that's a cue to people who play wind instruments. In order to achieve this balance, the misuse had to be stopped. And that is really a hugely important aspect of the Alexander technique. This had to be stopped. He must allow the neck to be free so his head could go forward and up and that the back could widen. These directions changed his use, his whole use, and improved his functioning. He discovered that he could stop these wrong habits, and these new habits could occur. After much observation, he gradually began to understand how his head, neck, and back could work together. The body working as a whole, he began to understand in what ways he was interfering with his optimal functioning, which was preventing him from really having a career. And the inflammation of the vocal cords disappeared, and his voice was totally reliable. So he stopped doing all of these horrible postural misappropriations, learned how to stop doing that, lengthen his back, elongate his spine, and let his neck be free, and his head um, come forward just a tad. Before his discoveries, he gasped and sucked in air, which bothered him, and now this is no longer happened. He could now just breathe with ease. He also realized that imperfect breathing was not limited to those with vocal problems, but it was experienced by many people. Over quite a long period of time, Alexander continued to observe himself in front of the mirror. Each time he saw himself interfere with good posture, he patiently stopped. If the head is correctly balanced on the body, Breathing takes care of itself. To have a balanced head, Alexander concluded that his mus misuse had to stop. He realized that he needed to do three things. The neck needed to be free so that the head could go forward and up and the back could lengthen and widen. Alexander called these three elements directions. And these directions changed the entire use of the body. In order to use these directions, he needed to stop his old habits. He called this stopping inhibition. 
inhibit in the sense of to stop, not in the psychological sense of that word. The directions, freeing your neck so the head could go forward and up and that the back could widen and the neck would be soft, was only possible if the inhibitory process is set in place first. The stopping of these bad interfering habits. Another way of saying this, he realized that if he stopped the wrong, the old wrong habits, then the right directions could occur. It be he began to understand that his head, neck, and back must work together, and he could not interfere with this functioning. When he was able to inhibit his old habits, the inflammation of his vocal cords disappeared and his voice became reliable and effective. His breathing completely changed. He no longer sucked or gasped for air, and his breathing became effortless. Alexander had discovered some very important principles. The use of the body affects its functioning. The body functions as a whole. The relationship between the neck, the head, the back, has a paramount influence on the whole body's, its posture and its health. Alexander's health improved to such a degree that his friends and several of the doctors that he had consulted earlier persuaded him to teach others what he had learned. He was at a turning point and needed to decide if he could continue in the theater or become a teacher of his discoveries. His own performance was so dramatically improved that many people sought him out as a teacher to teach them what he had learned. In modern usage, we would call this a tipping point. He began to teach pupils what he had learned. He eventually moved to London where he started a school and started a teacher training program. Alexander became known as the breathing man because of his ability to breathe effortlessly while acting or reciting. The Alexander technique brings about calmer, deeper breathing since all muscles are releasing and expanding. Breathing becomes easy and efficient. Alexander moved to London in 1909 and started to have many pupils actors, musicians, doctors, and others. He also wrote four books. As Alexander continued his observations, he discovered a very important concept that he called end gaining. End gaining describes the process of which a person is preoccupied with goals and disregards the goals, how the goals are attained resulting in an unsatisfactory use of the body and achieving the end at any cost. He encouraged a willingness and attention to the process by which an end is achieved. The use of the neck, head, and back should never be sacrificed to obtain a goal. Whether it's a running race or it's a concert or learning a new piece, nothing is worth destroying that relationship. The concept is especially important to musicians, and I will talk more about this in a few minutes. In London, Alexander became a very sought after teacher. The following people took lessons in the Alexander technique. Some of these people studied directly with Alexander or people he had trained. So for authors, there's George Bernard Shaw, Aldous Huxley, who wrote the preface for two of his books, Robertson Davies, Ronald Dahl, Jane Brody, the personal health columnist of the New York Times, actors. And Woodward, Robin Williams, James Earl Jones, Christopher Reeve, Judy Dench, Ben Kingsley, William Hurt, Hilary Swank, Heath Ledger, Price Brosman, and Juliet Benoche. The musicians who were interested in studying and took lessons, Paul McCartney, 
Sting, Julian Bream, the great guitarist, Yehudi Menuhin, the wonderful violinist, James Galway, the sensational flutist, and conductor Sir Colin Davis. Others who also studied the technique was Professor Nico Tinbergen, winner of the Nobel Prize in Medicine, Frederick Pearls, originator of Gestalt therapy, Moshe um, Feldenkrais, uh, originator of the Feldenkrais Method, and Terry Gross, host of the NPR program Fresh Air. Jacqueline Kennedy Onassis also studied as well. I would love to play for you two videos, um, and I want you to watch these performers and how their neck and head, shoulders and back um, show you the concepts that Alexander wanted to have people learn. This is the very famous uh, pianist, Arthur Rubinstein. He's able to have such a wonderful sound, wonderful technique, not playing slowly, and nothing in his body gets disturbed. And he had a very, very long career, and that's not an accident. Um, the second uh, performer, whom some of you may already know, is the, probably the, the most famous ballet dancer of the 20th century, Mikhail... Um, 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 well, you'll, you'll see, you'll see it. Um, Boryakov. Here we go. Come on. Hmm. This is tricky. Since supersonic hairdryer now features new attachments to style, define, or shape different types of next. hair.
Both of these wonderful artists had very long careers, um, performed for decades and decades without injury, um, and it was a pleasure to see them, and it looks like they could do this forever. Everything was so easy for them, and that's what we're all striving for, and those are the things that Alexander could teach. Um, the Alexander technique taught either in a class or one-on-one -on -one at a lesson, and I'll describe what a lesson would be like of a one-on-one -on -one with a student and a teacher. Often the teacher stands and while the teacher uses their hands to gently adjust the student so that the neck becomes freer, the head goes forward and up, and back becomes wider. It is a slow and very gentle process since the release of tension does not occur immediately. Students are asked to put their weight on both the ball and the heel of their feet. The student is encouraged to have the hips be released and free and the lower back to be relatively back, not forward, um, all the time thinking of the directions freeing the neck allowing the head to go forward and up, and the upper back to be free. This is a process that combines your thinking and your awareness of what your body is doing, a mind-body connection. While standing, it is helpful to practice breathing. Breathing is like a wave that goes out and comes in. It is useful to slowly exhale, say for four counts, and inhale for six counts. So I'm gonna just demonstrate what I'm doing, and I'd like to see if you can my metronome on, on 72, and I'm going to inhale for four counts, um, inhale for four counts and exhale for six, and then after I've exhaled, I'm gonna make sure that I just release my breathing muscles and inhale. So I'm just gonna do this. One. Try this with me. So sit or stand and you say to yourself, okay, you're gonna inhale for four counts. not hard, just feels easy to do. Your throat is open. It feels like hot soup kind of in the back of your throat. There is no effort in inhaling. The ribs can expand and contract. This process often allows the student to feel calmer, taller, and the body moves more easily. Not every Alexander lesson is the same, but I will describe to you a typical lesson here is what is referred to as the chair exercise, and I thought it would be helpful to look at that. And the chair exercise is a way of learning what your body is doing, and it's a really a great way to understand what inhibition is. I say to my students, no, thank you. Um, and Say you're a pianist or violinist or a flutist and you say, well, why are you having me do this work in a chair? It's important to be able to do something that you can just concentrate on your body and movement and understand what inhibition is and then you can later apply it to what your um, primary uh, concern is. So, um, And then we wait for a moment, and then we just gently come back. Just sitting quiet. This, yeah. this student is, works on a computer so during the day. During that act, we're going to not put compression on this back. And when so she began have, to do this, you she typically did this. Words, those little last guidelines say, allow neck to be free. And put her head back, the head and back then put her head forward. And she's talking it's about this. It's going to have its length, the torso, to widen. 
which is certainly what it's doing now. And then you've got a lovely breath. By a lovely breath, I mean what Alexander called full capacity breathing, where a natural breathing, it's where the lungs are getting air down to the bases of the lungs. It's not just upper respiratory panic attack type nervous situations. We can always come back to the, the inhibition of Alexander's lessons, learning to stop the automatic response to a stimulus. And we have the guidelines, lovely little guidelines, allow neck to be free, the head to balance up, which it is, your torsos lengthening, softening and widening, all that is taking place. So why should that be disturbed? Simply because you bounce out of a chair. We just do it unconsciously. Up goes the chin, crunch goes the head, and we stand up all day long. Terrible, terrible compression unconsciously. With this work, you're not doing that, so this becomes so strong and very flexible, and you become free of a lot of harmful habits. For me to help you, or to, to help you get that experience, we'll, we'll just stand up. To allow, now, to, before we stand up, it's an idea to bring the feet underneath you just a little bit more. And then we just wait, come quiet, not getting ready to push. Because I don't want the attention to the legs. That's your stand, it's already in the brain mechanisms that you're about to stand. We don't have to do any more than that. It's, it's there. <clears throat> what we do have to do is prevent the head, the habit, allow neck to be free, head to balance. Well, beautiful. And then I know, watch the chin, and that's going to work. A little bit of arms coming forward, but that's all right. We gently let the head float up again. Yes, 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 and up you go, lovely. Strengthening, letting the back lengthen, torso to soften and widen. And widen, beautiful. Just quiet, yes. So the goal here is not to go in and out of a chair perfectly, but I think this teacher targets something that's interesting, that people go and get in and out, up and down, on the subway, on their, in their dorm room, in a library. And if you do it long enough, over a long enough period of time, and you keep crunching your neck and compressing your spine, you'll have problems. Um, and you can be taught not to do that. Um, notice that the person, when she stood in front of the chair with her weight equally distributed over her feet, to sit in the chair, she let the hinge mechanism of her hips bring her back over the spine so that she was seated in an upright position. She did not think of going down. And in fact, the teacher said when she gets up, could she think that her head was like a kite and her spine was like the tail of the kite. And she was feeling weight on her feet and her calves were vertical to her knees. To stand up, her feet were flat on the floor and her ankles were free. Her head led the movement and she gently was nodding forward so that her body followed her head and she moved up in space. And it really looked effortless. With the help of a trained Alexander teacher, this exercise can re reveal unhelpful habits which the student can then be taught to inhibit. Learning to use the body to its best mechanical advantage takes time, but it's very helpful. The chair exercise has you thinking and practicing Alexander's directions. You can learn to inhibit any excess effort. We all have seen so many people get in and out of a chair. And if they were taught that there was a best mechanical advantage of using your body, they would have less pain, less difficulty. This is an essential idea that can transfer to many aspects of your life. The aim of learning this chair exercise is to teach you how to use the body without any holding, tension, or compression. Compression is a very, very important concept. 
It is a way to learn the concept of inhibition, the stopping of doing an old habit that interferes with the body being free. Many musicians find studying the Alexander Technique very helpful. Our habits have been established over a long period of time. Learning the concept of inhibition away from your instrument is very helpful. Once your body understands inhibition, then this can be applied to your instrument. Um, there's a, a, a very good uh, video, which I put on the reference guide, uh, a link to it, of a, an oboist who is studying at the School of Music at the University of Michigan. And he is taking an Alexander lesson. And in this video of, of his lesson, um, you see that most oboists play sitting down, and he's about to play sitting down. And this person often crossed his legs and bent forward to make, his, to make a read. So he's bending forward and making his reads. And they take a long time to make, so he's spending a lot of time doing in that position. This person, um, uh, while playing, he raised his shoulders, hunched his chest, swallowed breaths, breathing from the upper part of his chest, his playing was uncomfortable and tense. His Alexander lesson began with getting in and out of a chair. This person was very tall, and the teacher used a stool. It's important to have a chair or stool at the correct height. He became aware that he was what he was doing with his body before sitting down to play. He concentrated on his breathing so that nothing was forced. In standing up, he became aware that his feet fully supported his torso. Support comes from your feet into your legs and into your pelvis, so you do not need to hold on to yourself. At the point, he thought of Alexander's direction. Let your neck be free, let go, so that your head feels poised off your neck with your head forward and up, and often your head feels higher than many people think. Let your back widen. Many people grasp with their muscles, their neck muscles. At this particular Alexander lesson, the teacher guided the student onto the stool and asked him how he felt. She then asked him to slowly take his instrument, but asked him not to play. Note that his teacher did not ask him to take his instrument right away. She was interested to have this student not revert to old habitual patterns that cause stress. He then was asked to think of effortless breathing, openness in his ribs while keeping his elbows free without ever over-preparing. And the over-preparing is an interesting concept for many, many musicians. Many musicians have an idea of getting ready to play, which is static and sometimes with tension. And she's trying to really break those habits. He thought of the directions without holding in his body and without trying too hard. His attention was now on expressing the music. The oboist had taken many lessons and felt that these lessons were so helpful that he entered an Alexander training program. There is frequently a second part of an Alexander lesson where the student lies on a freestanding table, lies down. Lying down allows the spine to lengthen and to bring the head in a more forward position relative to the neck. In this lying down position with the knees bent, the pelvis can tilt backward and the lumbar spine flattens out. The sp spinal and abdominal muscles release any undue tension allowing gravity to let the diaphragm move up and down gently. Deeper breaths now occurs and the body calms down. In London, many orchestral musicians who have studied the Alexander Technique in school take time during their rehearsal break to find a quiet spot in the hall, to lie down for a few minutes, and to think of these principles to become revitalized for the rest of the rehearsal. And I thought I would show you just a, a sh short clip of what this lying down exercise was like. Uh, 
okay. Clarity of mind. Yeah, well, yeah. there's not really a lot going on. Mm. But that's just because there isn't anything going on. That's right. If something was, I'd, I guess I'd be able to tune into it quite easily. That's right. So it's that slowing down of the nervous system and the clarity of the thinking. And that was, you asked before about the breath and the, the mental system, the cognitive system functions at a higher level. Yeah. So the, there is that increased clarity of thinking when the mind-body recovers at its equilibrium. When you stop the trying and the effort and you surrender into this quality of, of letting and giving yourself over to gravity. The cognitive function... Sorry, the video was not very good on this one. Uh, one of the things that this teacher is trying to show is he wants the student not to do anything. And often in an Alexander lesson, the teacher will say, I'm going to move your arm, and this is what the student does. And the teacher says, no, 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 I I'm going to move your arm. And what this teacher is trying to do is saying, I'm going to move your leg, don't help me, so that you can learn that you can let go. And if you can let go raising your leg or raising your arm, you can let go playing the flute or the trumpet or the violin or the cello in the same way you can learn to let go. And so that, that is at least what a, a, a lying down exercise at least looks like. The steps to this exercise, and anyone can practice this in their practice room, in their dorm room, anywhere that they have a place to lie down. You put one or two paperback books under your head to support your neck. These books need to be about two inches off the floor. Sit on the floor in front of the books and gently exhale. Allow the spine to gently roll down slowly onto the floor until the back of your neck is supported by these books. Two books will reduce the natural curve, too few books will reduce the natural curve of the neck and too many will push the chin and your chest uh, and restrict your breathing. Bend your knees, bring your feet near to your buttocks, allow the back to sink into the floor so there is no arch in the lower back. That's a very big one and by practicing that, I'm very sway back and trying to get my release my back so it's flat on the floor, which feels a lot better, takes a little time. And let your spine sink into the floor. The head, the shoulders, the elbows, the hips, and your feet are supported by the table or, f or floor, and the muscles release so breath moves easily in and out. Take about five, 10 minutes less if you have less time to feel the changes in your body and in your breathing. After allowing enough time, now start to think about getting up. Don't do anything, just think you might possibly get up. And then, very slowly, get, turn your body to the side and get your feet forward and come up very, very slowly, bringing one foot in front of the other. While standing, feel that your collarbones are wide, your spine is long, your neck is soft, your head is going forward and up. And now you might want to gently walk around the room and see, does that feel any differently to you from when you first started to lie down? And all of that experience is for you to bring that feeling of being calm and poised and open into the rest of your life. Benefits of lying down, your muscles and joints are released. Muscles, your neck muscles are free. Pressure's taken off the spine. Eyes that you've left open feel relaxed. The diaphragm is released, easing breathing, and the jaw releases. Time is taken to think and become more conscious. I first looked for an Alexander teacher quite a long time ago. I was working on playing with a more comfortable neck and back. 
Flute playing is not so ergonomically wonderful. You're twisted to the side. Your neck sometimes is twisted along with you. Does your pelvis go with you? And after many decades of playing, many flute players have difficulty with neck and shoulders. And you can be ta taught not to do that. But that was my goal, is to have more comfort um, uh, in playing. I was fortunate to find an Alexander teacher who'd gotten his master's degree here at Tufts. And he was working with a Tufts professor, Frank Pierce Jones, who was doing research on the technique. Jones has written several books, and they're in the Tisch Library. My teacher, Joe Armstrong, who was a flutist, wrote a very interesting master's degree thesis. He tested the hypothesis that if instrumentalists were given training in the Alexander Principles, they could reliably increase their ability to cope with the problem of stress or nervousness in a performance situation. The students were divided into two distinct groups, an experimental group A and a control group B. The experimental group A was given an introductory course of Alexander lessons, while the control group B had no exposure to the Alexander technique at all. All performances were videotaped at the beginning of the six-week period. And at, and at the end, these subjects um, in group A were again videotaped and they had been given um, lessons, and so B group was taped too. There was not enough time in a six-week course to feel fully comfortable in a performance situation, but the students who had been given Alexander lessons felt that they had definitely learned a way of coping with stress that had helped them improve dealing with stress and that they definitely wanted to continue lessons in the Alexander Technique if they were given the opportunity to do so. The subjects in the control group B still felt nervousness to be a problem, and their last taping session, and were eager to learn a way to cope with stress and performance. This was a small study, and more extensive study needed to follow. However, these results were very encouraging since the students who were interviewed felt that the technique was very helpful to their overall playing and performing. I was able to study with Joe and found my lessons to be extremely valuable. I was impressed that after a lesson, my playing felt as though I had warmed up for a long time um, and uh, I had much greater ease, resonance, vibrancy, freedom, and comfort. It also helped me to perform with greater confidence. Even though I am not a trained Alexander teacher, I have taught many of my students these Alexander principles, and their breathing has greatly improved. Their flute sound is freer and more resonant, and their finger technique is far easier with much less effort. I've observed the following problems of musicians. I'm often teaching something and see students beating with their arms. So you say to yourself, well, what does that do to the head and the neck and the back? Nothing good. Um, they hold the instrument too low or too low, um, and that crunches everything it's bad for the head and neck. It's worse for the breathing. Um, something that I think is typical and I call a student breath, they inhale and exhale and try to inhale <clears throat> because they haven't released any of these muscles. Le leaning forward for difficult passages, they're, they're playing around and they're, what is that? What are those? Elements? Somehow, if you lean forward, you'll get the notes better. I think if you don't know the notes, you don't know the notes. So leaning forward is not so helpful. Um, but it's very typical and very common. I've seen students tighten their neck and very often giving way too little time to inhale. 
and breathing without releasing your intercostal or breathing muscles. Very commonly, when I play a scale, you can't hear my keys going up and down, but students often, you hear them very dramatically, up and down, up and down. No one has to press that hard. Um, it doesn't help your playing, um, it doesn't help your flute, um, and uh, no one needs to play with that much effort. Um, often, students will want to, they can play this way, or they, if you just find your ball of your feet and your heels, then you can play with much greater ease and much better support. Um, we bring poor habits of all aspects of our lives that do not include music. Using your computer, using your laptop, I see the following. There's the laptop, here's the laptop. So now you've now shortened everything. It's possible to, if this is too low, put some books underneath the laptop. Um, but there's no reason to all day long keep going forward or lying down. You can just find a chair, find a table, have a nice long neck, and you'll feel more energetic after the end of the study period. Um, Another typical thing, all day long. So it's a little bit like the chair exercise of going, crunching your neck, crunching your neck. Bring your cell phone up to you. You don't have to go to your cell phone. Um, another thing that I see a lot is you're reading a book. Bring the book to you, put it on a, Put several books together, prop it up, and start to read so that you don't have to co compromise. There's nothing that you should do that should compromise what you're doing with your head, your neck, and your back. Um, it will give you lots of problems now and later on. Um, you can apply Alexander's discoveries to your singing, wind, and brass playing, auditions, computer use, talking on your cell phone, cutting vegetables, walking, running, brushing your teeth, lifting a heavy package, carrying your backpack, and speaking in public, to name just a few. Let's look at a few common components of all of them. And I'll deal with first breathing. Um, we talked about it being like a wave. Allow your jaw and throat to be free, like yawning as you inhale. It's a reflex, you don't have to do anything. Never haul in the air. Can you imagine going to the sea and seeing a wave come out and thinking, oh, wave, come back, come back. It just goes out and comes back. And breathe, breathe. if you don't interfere with your breathing, it is the same. Tight muscles make a sound when you inhale. Um, take time to inhale and you are not late for the airplane. The enemy of playing or singing too much effort, over-efforting, a tight body, pinching, tight jaw. Um, I wanted to demonstrate, and I still think I, maybe I can do this wearing a mask. Um, this uh, is a surgical breathing bag, and the very famous tuba player in the Chicago Symphony uh, wanted to be able to teach breathing in a more comprehensive way. You need a tremendous amount of air in the toba and just a little bit less on the flute. So he went, he taught at Northwestern and he went to the medical school and he worked with some pulmonologists and they were using this for patients who had, had anesthesia to get their lungs to function. And so what he wanted his students to do was to do exercises blowing up this bag inhaling, blowing it up. And when I started using this with my students, it was very interesting to me. Some people, I would say, okay, take six counts to blow it up, and they, by, by count two, the whole bag would be blown up. Well, if you're playing a musical phrase, you have no air left for the next half measure, next measure, next measure in that part of the phrase. One of the things that I have experienced in using breathing bags with my students is there is a little tube here and you have to put that around your mouth uh, in order to blow up this bag. 
um, I put on my website, um, on my uh, reference guide, uh, where you could get a breathing bag from. Um, I particularly like this one because this particular tube is well suited for my purpose of learning to open the jaw and exhale. And so I like to do this for six counts and four counts, three and two. Sometimes I do it again with a metronome. And then one, one, one. And it's amazing how much air you can get in your body quickly with an open throat and open jaw. And uh, it's been very helpful and very useful. Um, and I won't, if it were any other time other than the COVID-19, I would demonstrate it. Um, so uh, using a breathing bag is very helpful, but I'm now gonna go on to, there's first is breathing, is holding your instrument. So if you stand with your feet uh, and weight well balanced and you take your trumpet up, you don't need to come forward. You keep your buttocks back and you just, nothing, your, your arms are easy or your arms here. Your wrists are very easy and all you do is inhale, stop, and then with good breath support, play very effortlessly and you'll get a good sound. Um, in a way you hold your instrument will contribute to the success you are as a player. If you're a singer, all these principles apply to you as well. Sit or stand, allow your neck to be free so that your head can go forward and up and your back can lengthen and widen. Take a few effortless breaths. Think of starting to play the piano, stop, and think about doing this. Avoid quickly picking up your instrument and reinforcing your old habits. Slowly go to your instrument Balance it in your hands. Feel free in your arms, elbows, and wrists. Use a mirror and gently start to play. Observe like we saw before in this man looking in the mirror. You'll notice what you do and keep the good things and discard what is not helpful. As a teacher, I often see students go forward to their instrument and not bring their instrument up to them. Going forward tenses the neck, arms, and breathing. Allow time to breathe. Practice releasing your breathing muscles. Um, the following ideas are from an excellent article in the 2019 Flutus Quarterly that Lorna McGee wrote. Lorna McGee is the principal flutist of the Pittsburgh Symphony, and I think she's one of the great flutists um, of our time. As a student at the Royal College of Music in London, she was motivated to study the Alexander Technique since she had shoulder pain. Her lessons alleviated her shoulder pain and helped her understand how to practice constructively. In her article, she talks about practicing. The challenge in practicing is to avoid end gaining. That is focusing on achieving a specific result while you neglect the means that you are using. End gaining is often part of playing too fast before you're ready to do that. Listening to a recording and trying to mimic it before you're ready. I think it's very helpful to listen to recordings, but you can't play as fast as the professional player if this is just a piece you are learning. You can so focus on, you are so focused on getting through a difficult passage without making mistakes that you neglect to notice that your fingers grip and the keys much too tightly or that your wrists are locked or that you have stopped the free flow of air. In singing, you may worry about reaching particular high notes and you tighten your throat and body in anticipation, making your task far more difficult. This type of practice is antagonistic. It is like accelerating and braking at the same time. Instead of keeping your body peaceful in the midst of activity, keep the physical quietness and balance you find in a slow piece into speed. There is no need for more effort when playing fast. And I'll say that again. There is no need for more effort when playing fast. Let your fingers alight on the keys like a butterfly on a leaf. 
There's no need to press or grip the keys. Think of what is the minimum movement you can have of your hands and fingers. Let your arms be balanced, not rigid. Let your joints be full of air, not concrete. You can do this playing tennis. You can do it playing basketball. You can do it playing a musical instrument. Practice short, accurate micro movements with ease and poise. Break a difficult passage into tiny chunks and pay attention to your use. Do not create bigger chunks until you have ease, consistency, and mastery. Just playing slowly is not enough. Technique is coordination. Technique is memory building, building a memory bank of accurate, effortless experience. Give yourself time to get coordinated, but do not practice just slowly. Practice the smallest manageable chunk up to the tempo with accurate and peaceful physical poise. If you find yourself grasping, then say to yourself, cease and desist. Free the neck. The reality is the concert is going to go on anyway. You can choose to be in a flap or not. Remember, you have a choice. We are not victims. Playing fast is just a series of masterful, easy micro movements, nothing more. Whatever you practice, uh, whatever we practice, we reinforce. Therefore, constantly reinforce the good stuff. Don't even give an inch to practicing in a fluster. You will only have to undo the damage. Don't waste your time and be wise. I'll play a recording of Lorna McGee playing the Largo from J.S. Bach's solo violin sonata in C. Notice her posture, her neck, her vibrant sound, her breathing, and how beautifully she plays expressively. Okay, clarity of mind. Yeah. Clarity, okay. Clarity of mind. Yeah, well, yeah. there's not really a lot going on. Mm. But that's just because there isn't anything going on. Well, let's see. It's worked at home. Let's try it one more time. Clarity. Back, for sure. Yes. I'm sorry. It feels like. Um, something got messed up here. Wait a second. That's. Um, I'll do one other thing to see if it works. Well, I'm going to go on. It's, um, I'll include her performance in my uh, guide. Um, Lorna McGee continues to say, another idea is to separate out the individual kinesthetic elements of a piece and then combine them gradually. Practice fingers separately. Practice the tone that you want. Take as long as it takes. Be satisfied with steady, realistic progress. Do not sabotage yourself by getting frustrated trying to bite off more than you can chew. Find your edge and stay there for a while. Be your own best teacher. At all times in practice, do not under any circumstances reinforce stress or panic that is inviting failure. In the words of the famous cellist Pablo Casals, playing an instrument should increase a person's confidence, not fear. Practice patience and develop trust in your ability. Technique is only coordination. We are less coordinated when we are stressed, so create the conditions that allow you to flourish. 
Choose how you respond to stimulus. Technique is kinesthetic memory. Therefore, create a positive, healthy memory bank of templates, as F.M. Alexander said. People do not decide their futures. They decide their habits, and their habits decide their futures. I'm going to say that again. People do not decide their futures. They decide their habits, and their habits decide their futures. So if you look back at the original photograph of the man standing there all crunched over, you can imagine that he lost his voice, and his habits certainly determined his future. He absolutely had to give up acting. Lorna McGee goes on to speak about breathing. We must not block the air with unnecessary tension. Studying the Alexander technique directly will improve the quality and efficiency of your breathing. Don't give in to forcing or squeezing. The temptation might be to blow very hard. Try not to push or pull the airstream, but release the air generously and allow it to replace itself. Make your body a cathedral of resonance, and like a great singer, a lovely resonant vowel sound inside the mouth, head, and chest. Um, I've seen a wonderful demonstration of a beautiful large wine glass, and that you just touch it, and it vib the sound vibrates the room. And that's what we want our sounds to be like. We won't, don't want it to go thud each time you try to move your implement. Um, your body is a cathedral of resonance. Remember the Alexander Technique's directions, free the neck, let the head go forward and up, and lengthen uh, and widen the back. Inhibit pulling down or collapsing down, no gripping the instrument. Be relaxed and dynamic. This is not just for slow playing. Performers have the right to be free, poised, and balanced. Claim this right. Keep your dignity and take up your space in the world. Let's say in the heat of battle of performance, you try too hard. What to do? Inhibit and direct. Release the singing sound, the quality, release the singing quality in the sound, no matter what the circumstances, and have the courage to come in on that high note without over efforting. Play or sing positively. Remember the constructive directions that allow you to do your best. Free the neck, let the head be forward and up, back lengthened and widened, focus on the music. And in conclusion, Lorna once asked her Alexander teacher, what was the purpose of studying the Alexander technique? Her teacher's response was, to fulfill your potential for expression. So suddenly, the mistakes are not the focus anymore. It doesn't get much better than that. There is no substitute for one-on-one -on -one lessons with a qualified Alexander teacher, which no one is going to go out and do at the moment. However, what I've covered this evening is a roadmap to help us perform at our best. You can begin to apply many of these ideas right now, even as you listen to this presentation, not to mention in your next practice session or lesson. Stop doing what does not work. Invite what does work and get out of your own way. Then you are truly able to be service to the music that you play. Thank you. <laughs>